Well, our next speaker sets up. We have Gopal Goel. Um, his short bio here, it says that um, he is a genius and that's it. <laughs> uh, no, so Gopal is uh, currently a freshman at MIT studying mathematics and physics. He's the youngest attendee at the conference. Um, he was homeschooled by Parma Karuna who spoke yesterday and has won many academic awards, including a gold medal at the International Physics Olympiad, July of 2018, a silver medal, no gold, just silver? <laughs> silver medal at the International Mathematical Olympiad, September 2020, and USA Math Olympiad winner 2020 and 2021. He has been a mentor for the Harvard Physics Circle since 2020, and he has also has four peer-reviewed publications in various math and physics journals. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to be giving a little bit of a different style of talk where I'm just going to be overviewing uh, one a model, uh, a cyclic cosmology model uh, that's that uh, is based on uh, Sir Roger Penrose. So Sir Roger Penrose came up with this uh, model for cyclic cosmology. I'm just gonna give an overview of that. Uh, so basically the, the motivation for this talk is that uh, in the sort of modern cosmological picture, uh, we understand that uh, sort of the universe starts with the Big Bang and uh, it just continues until eventually, um, uh, so after the Big Bang, matter coalesces into galaxies and things like that. But eventually all this uh, matter, eventually all this matter collapses into like black holes and eventually those black holes decay and all you get is just radiation. And you sort of have like this, uh, the universe eventually cools all the way down to absolute zero and you sort of have like this heat death of the universe. So that's sort of the picture to show on the left where you just go from the Big Bang to the end of time. However, in the Peronic model, we know that we have a, we have a, cyclic, a cyclic universe. So there seems to be a conflict here uh, where most modern cosmological models are not cyclic. However, uh, recently there have been more interest in cyclic cosmological models in the mainstream uh, scientific community. And in particular, uh, Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology is uh, one, of the, um, one of the very important cyclic models. And I'll touch upon why this is, it's, it's special in sort, of, uh, in sort of scientific discussions. But in this talk, I'm just gonna be giving an overview of that, of Roger Penrose's uh, cyclic universe model. So just uh, be before we start talking about his model, let's just give an overview of the sort of basic overview of the current picture of uh, how, of the timeline of the universe. So pretty much right after the Big Bang, what you have is you have a bunch of particles. And since the temperature is extremely high after the Big Bang, uh, these particles have extremely high kinetic energies. And pretty much what this means is that they're moving very close to the speed of light. And according to special relativity, this basically implies that you can treat those particles as massless. Uh, because they're moving so fast, so close to the speed of light. And after this uh, early stage, eventually matter coalesces and you get, um, you get protons and you get all these particles and eventually uh, you get stars and you get galaxies. So just I've drawn a little sketch here uh, where you have some galaxies and maybe you have a couple black holes as well. This, this is supposed to represent a black hole. Uh, this, is just, this is just a sketch. And then eventually uh, what happens after a long, long time is that uh, eventually all matter uh, condenses into these black holes. So all you have maybe are just some black holes and some radiation. And then after an even longer period of time, around 10 to the 100 years or something, uh, uh, these black holes also evaporate into just radiation. And all you have left in the universe is just pure radiation. So uh, just a, maybe just a bunch of photons, gravitons, things like that. But the feature that I want to point out here is that the um, at the end stage, all you have is all these just like uh, photons and gravitons and such, and they're also massless particles moving at the speed of light. So sort of, even though the early universe is extremely hot and the late universe is extremely cold, you do have this um, similarity where both of them are dealing with the physics of massless particles. And that's actually a key feature in, uh, in Penrose's model. So um, I'll, I'll touch upon this in the next slide, but or, or, yeah, I'll just get, um, so the, the sort of the, the reason we care about this is that basically the physics of massless particles is what's known as conformally invariant. And basically what that means, and I'll touch upon this later, is that massless particles cannot uh, perceive time scales or distance scales. 
So from their perspective, and, and since the universe is only contained of massless particles, the, the first stage and the final stage are actually quite similar. But um, before I get into that, let me sort of talk about a little more formally what I mean by uh, this sort of notion of not caring about distances. Uh, so it's, it's basically this notion of conformal transformation. So a, a conformal transformation is essentially a geometric, a geometric mapping, which, uh, doesn't which can change distances wildly, but it still preserves local angles and local shape. So uh, I have a couple of pictures here. Let me just go through what these pictures mean. So on the left here, uh, I just have a, a grid and then uh, I've applied some conformal transformation to it. So some geometric transformation. And as you see, it's sort of completely warped the grid. And it's important to know this is all in 2D. So I have a, a grid here and I've applied a mapping and now it's some, some sort of warped grid. But uh, it turns out that the, if you look at the intersections of the grid lines, they're still locally orthogonal. They're still locally at 90 degrees to each other. So I've sort of zoomed in on one section here so you can see a little clearer. But um, in this sort of curved picture, these, these grid lines still are uh, exactly at 90 degrees angles with respect to each other. Even though if you look at the global structure, it's been completely warped. So, uh, and, and, and the picture on the right is, it's a very famous painting by uh, this artist Escher who drew many uh, sort of weird mathematical paradoxical drawings. You should check out his work if you're interested in this kind of thing. But basically what, uh, what's shown here is, uh, this is not exactly a conformal transformation, but what I want you to notice here is we've sort of tiled the, um, the disc with all these angels and demons. And uh, th the size of these angels and demons is obviously changing. However, if you, if you look carefully, you'll see, for example, that sort of the angle between these devils, the angle at the devil's wings is always the same in every single devil you look at, even the ones towards the edge. Sort of the, the, the local shapes of these figures are the same. And uh, I, this also brings out another feature of these conformal transformations, which is that you can have geometric transformations which preserve angles, but which change distances so wildly that you can take infinities to sort of finite regions, and you can also take uh, singularities and blow them up into sort of non-singular singular regions. Uh, so sort of in this picture, you can see if you imagine a space where these, these uh, angels and devils have the same size, then maybe it extends out infinitely, but in this sort of a transformed picture, we've preserved their shapes, but uh, the sort of infinite boundary has been sort of collapsed into a finite region. So this is a property of these conformal transformations that you have this, you have this uh, ability to, to do this. All right. So um, like I said before, the reason we care about this is that if I have a bunch of massless particles, then it turns out that um, they cannot, the physics of them, uh, you cannot say anything about distances uh, distance scales or length or time scales. And because of that, if you sort of apply one of these uh, transformations, which preserves angles, but changes distances, the physics looks identical. So um, the reason for this sort of one way to think about this is if you know a little bit of special relativity, uh, you'll know that if uh, if a uh, observer, if, if, if a object is moving really close to the speed of light, or let's say really fast, then its clock appears to be moving slower. And uh, and if you take the limit as the object, so sort of this runner is my, is my sort of uh, particle, and let's say he moves exactly the speed of light or he approaches the speed of light, which is sort of what this picture is trying to show, then his clock essentially stops. And he's not, because according to relativity, this, this, uh, this runner would not be able to perceive the passing of time. And pretty much if I have a universe like on the right where all I have is these photons, which are all moving at the speed of light, um, there's nothing in the universe which can keep track of time. And if you can't keep track of time, you can't not, you cannot, keep track of length scales. And that's sort of a intuitive reason why if I just have a bunch of massless particles moving at the speed of light, then uh, only thing that matters is the sort of conformal structure, uh, the sort of distance structures and stuff don't really matter in that situation. So the idea, um, Penrose's main idea then is to, uh, is, is the following. Uh, so, uh, so this picture over here, this picture on the left is essentially just a sketch of the universe and um, the, the y-axis is time. So at, at the start, you have, the, you have a big bang and uh, as time goes on, this universe expands and let's say it keeps expanding forever, whatever. This is some sort of just sketch of a standard universe picture. However, uh, if I can apply conformal transformation to this space time, and it turns out that I can sort of take this singularity of the Big Bang, but um, apply some transformation which preserves angles but changes distances, 
to sort of smooth out that big bang into some sort of uh, smooth boundary. So I just um, schematically represented it as a sort of like circular boundary, but obviously these are all like really high dimensional space time. So it's not as simple as this, but you can sort of imagine taking the big bang and sort of smoothing it out into a, a finite boundary, which you can do through these sort of geometric transformations that preserve angles, but don't not distances. And then what you can do is once you sort of have smoothed out this big bang into a, uh, into a smooth boundary, you can actually conceive of a potential space time that uh, happens before the big bang as well, which you couldn't do if, it, uh, if the big bang is a singularity because then uh, you can't, you can't um, smoothly extend space time before it, but you can imagine space time before the big bang if, on, uh, if you apply this transformation. And again, this transformation is valid because at the big bang and right after the big bang, all the physics of everything going on is, is ex at extremely high temperatures, which as you said before, corresponds to massless particles which means that we have the freedom to sort of do these conformal transformations. Okay, so there's a lot to digest on the slide, but let me go through it slowly. But um, the idea is that you can, so if I go back to this picture, I can do the same thing with the sort of end of time boundary. Now this is a bit harder to imagine, but sort of like at the end of time, you have this infinite boundary, uh, this infinite uh, part, this infinite um, sort of end of time stage. And you can also transform that into the same sort of uh, smooth smooth uh, boundary like this, because like we saw in the Escher picture, you can take infinite uh, boundaries and turn, turn them into finite boundaries using these conformal transformations. So in this picture, what's happening is, uh, let's just focus on one of these little cones. So this cone is exactly the same drawing I showed before of a universe where it starts at a big bang and it just keeps on expanding in the vertical directions. That, that vertical direction is time. So what's happening here is that the big bang uh, has been rescaled into the sort of like circular disk. And similarly, if I look at this universe right here, the end of time boundary, which is, it's sort it's it's hard to see here because it's sort of infinitely out, but that also has been sort of rescaled into the same, sim, uh, into the same boundary. And then I can glue these universes together and sort of construct a cyclic model in this way, where uh, the sort of the end of the end of time for one universe, because at that point, all that's left is just massless particles sort of acts as the, acts as the sort of big bang stage for, an, for another universe. And that way you sort of have like a sequence of universes connected in this way. And this is essentially, uh, this is essentially what um, Penrose's cyclic model uh, is saying. Okay. So one uh, sort of important thing I wanna mention about conceptualizing this model is that it's not really so there's other cyclic models which are which are very popular in the past, especially like this bouncing universe model where maybe uh, eventually the universe gets so massive and gravity eventually pulls everything back or, or, or something like that where it bounces back and uh, eventually bounces back into a big bang stage which then it um, expands again and you sort of have like this sort of like um, physical bouncing of the universe. Which, is, which gives you a cyclic model. So this is not really like that. We're not um, really like taking the end of time stage and it's not sort of collapsing back into a big bang stage. We're just saying that sort of that end of time stage uh, from the perspective of the particles there acts as a, as a big bang stage for a new universe. So in some sense, you can think of it as like a fractal. Uh, this, is not, this, is, this is a very imperfect analogy. Um, it's not really like a fractal, but you can, in the sense that you sort of have these self similar uh, things coming out of boundaries of like, other self similar objects. So it, I guess it's not really like the space time is contracting into a singularity and bouncing in that way. Uh, so now there's a slide here, which is some, some theoretical issues with this model, but I'll skip that for now and we can come back to it later if there's uh, more interest in that. But what I want to talk about is the reason why this model uh, is really important to think about is that it's really the first cyclic model in uh, mainstream cosmology that, uh, that, that gave any sort of chance at physical predictions. So in the past, all these cyclic models were basically unfalsifiable, where they were just sort of um, uh, things that, 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 that theoretical physicists would think about, but wouldn't actually lead to any predictions. Uh, Penrose, the way, the way his model is constructed, actually uh, was able to make some concrete predictions about the cosmic microwave background, which speakers have talked about before. But basically, what, um, according to his model, uh, he expected that in the cosmic microwave background, you should see these sort of rings of correlated temperatures. 
And uh, the idea essentially is that um, you have two points on the cosmic microwave background, which are too far away to be correlated. But if you have sort of space time before the Big Bang, then um, certain points on uh, rings can actually be correlated because their correlation happens before the Big Bang. That's essentially the, the, the vague idea of it. So he, he's made some concrete predictions about these uh, rings of correlation. But um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, like uh, these haven't been super solidly verified. There have been a couple papers uh, claiming to show these results, but it hasn't been reproducible. And uh, the statistical significance of those results is disputed. But uh, nonetheless, it's very important to, to think about this model because it's basically the first cyclic model, which was uh, given any sort of serious credence in the community because it was not just a purely metaphysical uh, thought experiment, pretty much. And again, I, I also want to mention that uh, I'm not really like, as far as I can tell, this is not, I can't draw any correlations between this model and a Peronic uh, Bhagavatam model of the universe, uh, besides the fact that it is cyclic in nature. Um, in my opinion, sort of these bouncing models have more have more direct correlation with the descriptions in the Puranas. But um, nonetheless, uh, I still think it's important to consider this model, first of all, because I said it's, it's one of the um, more uh, taken seriously models. It's one of the models that was taken more seriously in the scientific community. And also his idea of using conformal transformations to sort of um, glue universes together is an idea that could still be uh, potentially useful in other cyclic universe theories.